What's up, everybody? Welcome in. We're here to talk about yesterday afternoon and this morning in the Hannah Gutierrez Rust Armor trial. A lot of fireworks yesterday and late yesterday with lawyering, some objections, some argumentative questions, a lawyer withdrawing, which is kind of wild, and I haven't really gotten to the bottom of it. I've seen the order. Um, one of Hannah Gutierrez's lawyers, the bigger guy with the, the brown or black beard, um, who's done some of the questioning. He was also involved in some of the hearings he asked to withdraw. And apparently Hannah Gutierrez asked for him not to speak with her anymore. The judge denied his motion to withdraw, um, said he's still going to sit at council table. So there's not maybe an issue that the jury thinks has popped up, but he has instructed, the judge has instructed him not to speak to Hannah Gutierrez at her request. And Mr. Bowles, the bald lead attorney for Hannah Gutierrez, is going to um, infuse the female lawyer that we've seen ask some questions, I think, to help and aid in the defense and maybe, ha maybe handle some of, I think, Bullion, Todd Bullion, something like that is his name. Pretty wild. Pretty wild for that to happen this early on in the trial after representing her for what seems like many months. Um, but again, we don't know the dynamic dynamics going on behind the scene. So as we jump into the testimony over the last two days, make sure you guys hit that like button and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We've got some other videos coming up tonight. Uh, Lori Vallow update. One of her jurors speaks out. We're going to react to that interview and talk about her most recent hearing. And then tomorrow um, we are going to discuss the Brian Koberger hearing. I'm going to go on with JB and discuss it and we'll do a video as well. I don't know if it'll be live or recorded, but we will continue to cover this case as long as you guys have questions. Starting with the last witness yesterday, which took up, I believe the whole afternoon basically, which was the Dolly grip guy. Some people calling him Walter White. We're going to bring him up on screen. So everybody knows who I'm talking about. And a lot of the video today is going to focus on him because, um, this was the first witness that was basically intricately involved on scene, involved in the safety issues, witness to the um, accidental discharges, witness to, and with his experience being on, you know, 200 movie sets on what armors do. He helps specifically with the director of photography, which is Helena Hutchins. And as he describes the, or uh, what happened that day, he is choked up multiple times, very sad. Very tough testimony to listen to. We're going to recap that first. And then when we get to his cross is when things start to get really interesting. And I want your all's opinion as potential jurors on how effective you think this type of cross-examination is. When we get there, we'll talk about it more. Um, the first part of the clip I want to play is when he explains what an armor does on set. There was a bunch of objections as to whether or not he should be able to testify to this because he's not an armor. He's not an expert on it but the judge lets him testify to what he has seen, what he has experienced, um, factually speaking, and what he believes an armor should be doing on set to keep things safe. And I think this is very important testimony. We're going to talk about the, the firearm expert that's testifying right now and his cross-examination is going to happen after lunch. We're going to talk about, about him at the end of the video. And as great as his testimony may be, it's not super helpful in this case. The state has to prove that this was the firearm, that the bullet came from this firearm and that it happened because of what people did to that firearm. But it's not as important to this case as it will be to Alec Baldwin's case. This guy, this testimony is incredibly important for this case. Incredibly important. That's why we're going to spend some time on it today. Films with armorers. Do you know what the armorer is responsible for? Yes. Can you tell us? Um, my understanding of the armor's responsibilities is any working firearms and any ammunition is under their control. And when you say that working firearms and ammunition are under your control, um, are under their control, let me ask you, in your experience, are there certain industry protocols that are followed on movie sets by armors? So we talked about what is the duty what is Baldwin's duty for his case? What is Hannah Gutierrez Reed's duty as an armor? What are her expectations? What is she supposed to do? Forget about her age and whether she's incompetent or not. She took the job. What is her duty? 
Because in order for involuntary manslaughter here to show some kind of negligence, she has to have had a duty that she failed at, that she breached that duty, that she disregarded it recklessly. So what is that duty? And what did she do with regards to that duty? That's what he's testifying to. Yes. So they have a couple it, sidebars we're going to skip has that about whether or not he has the experience to testify to this, but eventually he is. It's made you familiar with what you believe are the industry protocols for armors on movie sets. More sidebars. In the films that you worked on where there was an armor, and for the purposes of this question, we're excluding the movie Rust. So now what he's going to do, and I think this was smart by the prosecutor because she's trying to get this evidence out. And we're going to talk later about pulling the evidence out of the best witness you possibly can. And don't ask a witness if they're not going to have a good enough explanation of what you want it to be. Um, again, we'll talk about that later, just some lawyering stuff, behind the scenes stuff. But for this situation, she's doing a great job of getting the evidence out that he knows from his experience, not as an expert, but just as somebody on a bunch of movie sets. And now what they're going to do is compare what he has seen at other movie sets. So we're going to get that background first and that explanation. Then she's going to compare it to how Hannah Gutierrez was acting on the set of Rust. Did you notice certain safety protocols that you yourself saw armorers engage in in all of those movies up until you got to the movie Rust? Yes. So I'd like to talk to you about those. In the other movies where there were armorers that you worked on, can you describe for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury how, uh, under what circumstances in your experience, can you describe the safety protocols that the armorers on those other movies engaged in when they would bring a firearm onto set for use in filming a scene? Your Honor, I'm also going to object to relevance. What happened in other movies has no relevance. Another sidebar. With safety protocols uh, by film set armorers, when the armorer brings a weapon onto set to be used in the filming of a scene prior to your experience on the set of rest. Uh, my experience has been that uh, typically the armorers mm -hmm. would have some sort of uh, safety meeting or lecture uh, before any of uh, firearms are gonna be used in the filming of a scene. And let me, I'm gonna stop you right there. In terms of the safety meeting, who is the person on set in your experience who usually calls for the safety meeting? Uh, the first assistant director. And that would not be Ms. Gutierrez? Uh, no, it would not. Who is the first assistant director in this case? Uh, the first assistant director on Rust is uh, Dave Halls. Okay. So there's the first, and the, the defense is going to point the finger at Dave Halls, and this witness gives them a lot of ammunition against Dave Halls, and we're going to talk about that more during cross. But um, what's interesting is, He's talking about how there were safety meetings and there were attachments to emails about how to act safely on these other uh, movie sets that did not happen on Rust. And that's kind of going to be the overarching theme of his testimony is usually there are all these safety protocols, but not on Rust. Uh, so you mentioned one of the first things that happens is there's a safety meeting. Uh, typically, we would discuss, uh, I guess I should back up. Typically, when we receive um, our call sheets, uh, an email call sheet the night prior to filming. Hey, hang on just a second, because I don't know that we have very many people here that are in the film industry. What's a call sheet? Um, so I would receive an email, typically receive an email every night before filming. And that email would include um, a call sheet that would list um, who will be on set, both cast and crew. It'll tell us what scenes we're doing. It'll tell us locations, kind of general information for the day, um, weather, what time the sun goes up and down, whatever um, production uh, feels is pertinent information. And then a lot of times what they'll attach to that email are um, the sides, the actual parts of the script we're shooting for the day, and then safety bulletins, whatever union um, safety bulletins would be appropriate for that day, whether firearms or animals, uh, inclement weather. Um, and then on the day of filming, uh, typically the first assistant director would call for um, a safety meeting and call all of the cast and crew that would be involved to listen to that meeting. And potentially the armor may have something to say uh, as far as um, what we're doing if we're firing blanks. Here's the- oh, Hang on, I'm gonna stop you right there. Um, so hypothetically, if, this, if the scene calls for the firing of blanks, because we haven't had a lot of this testimony in trial yet, mm -hmm. can you explain to the jurors what your understanding is about uh, the difference in the different loads of blanks? Uh, in my experience. So Bodhi asking if the, allowing this type of testimony is an appellate issue. Well, the defense objected this many times. Usually that leads you to believe they think it might be an appellate issue. 
Um, in my opinion, he's pretty much testifying to factually what he has observed in other cases and comparing it to this and why he felt unsafe, that it wasn't just speculation, but it was based on a factual background of what he knew to be true. Um, now, why didn't he stand up to Baldwin? Why didn't he do certain things? That's fodder for cross-examination, and they do get into that. So I don't know that I would say this was a big deal, especially if the information is correct. Um, now, if he's just totally wrong and they have an expert come in that say, you know, nothing he said is actually true and it, you know, colored the jury against Hannah Gutierrez, then potentially that's an issue. But I don't see it as a major issue. The judge could have, it's one of those judicial discretion. The judge could have allowed him to talk about it. It also probably would have been appropriate if the judge would have said, no, call an actual expert armor to, to testify to this. That would have been okay too. Usually those are not the best appellate issues when they really could go either way. And it's based on judicial discretion. The, the armor would tell us if we're using dummies or blanks, and if we're using blanks, which would make a noise in a flash, they would typically describe the power. Um, quarter load, half load, full load would give us some indication as to uh, the potential uh, danger with that particular um, firearm being used by the actor in that scene. And let me, let me stop you right there. You talked about the particular danger. Um, can blanks be dangerous on a movie set? My understanding is they can, yes. And are there certain... Is there certain safety gear uh, that some crew members may use if there is going to be firing of blanks in their uh, immediate proximity? Yes. And can you explain to the, to, to the jurors uh, what that would be in your experience? Certainly. Um, uh, the very basic um, personal protective equipment we would use would at the very least be safety glasses and some form of hearing, protect hearing protection, pardon me. Um, but sometimes it may be uh, covering the camera operators that may be in jeopardy with special coats. Um, to deflect anything coming out of those firearms. We may protect the camera and the lens with uh, special acrylics like Lexan bulletproof glass, essentially. So um, yes, we would take certain precautions. Is that the reason that it's important for you to know what size blank is gonna be used? Yes. And with regard to dummies, go, go ahead and, and continue to kind of walk us through how this would work. So uh, typically, uh, depending on the firearms being used, in this case, it was a Western. So a lot of the firearms were older Western style um, six guns where you would see if the gun was potentially loaded or not. Um, and sometimes that may simply mean loaded with a dummy round. So if the camera saw uh, the front of the firearm, uh, the audience would think that it was absolutely a loaded firearm. But um, the dummy rounds typically for us as the crew um, are are different than the blanks in that they may appear as though they're a, a real um, bullet, but they would typically have a hole drilled in them or the primer at the end that would ignite that bullet would be removed or already be uh, pushed in. Um, and then sometimes the dummies, uh, depending on how they're being used in the film, you can't make holes in them. So what the, uh, I guess the props people that make them put a little BB in there. So the armor can shake that dummy and you would hear a little BB rattle in there. And, that and he says, later in his testimony that he has seen armors do that in the past and they show the round to the set and crew and everybody basically there feels comfortable that this is not a live round and it would be obvious if it was a live round. I'm going to jump ahead just a minute or two. Safety meetings, the safety meetings are called by the assistant director and not the armor. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, with regard to safety bulletins, was there a difference between the way that safety bulletins were handled on the set of Rust and the way that safety bulletins were handled on the other films you participated in that had firearms and armorers. Yes. Tell us the difference. So in those emails that I referred to earlier, um, it typically would say, please, you know, would ask us to please refer to uh, the appropriate safety bulletins. And then they would list the number of that bulletin. And then in that email, I'd be able to click on a link if I so chose to review that bulletin. Um, I don't recall any of those bulletins actually being attached to our um, emails during Rust. You don't recall ever getting a single one? I don't recall ever receiving a safety bulletin from Russ Productions, no. Let's jump to safety meetings. Um, on the Yeah, not all of that is Hannah Gutierrez's fault, but he basically says later, she should have pushed back. She should have stepped up. Armors are usually the most ornery and, you know, straight laced tight people on set because they're always, you know, literally safety and people's lives are in their hands. And she wasn't like that at all. Um, and you know, on cross, they try to make it seem like it's because she's a female or because she's 24. He's saying this in reality, her youth and inexperience, I think is part of what the jury is going to have to experience. I'm sorry, is going to have to evaluate and determine if that adds to the negligence and in the involuntary manslaughter, or if it's something that gives her a pass. I mean, that that's something that's being put before this jury for sure. Other sets that you worked on that had guns and armorers, 
how frequently would a safety meeting occur? Um, at least once a day, if not more frequently. And on the set of Rust, how frequently did safety meetings occur? I don't know that I was invited to more than one during our couple of weeks on Rust. So for the entire two weeks, you only were, were you are only aware of one safety meeting. That's my recollection. Yes. Okay, so we've talked about safety bulletins and safety meetings. Go ahead and continue to walk us through, um, in your experience, the protocol of an armor with firearms. Um, in my experience, the the armors are usually the, uh, well, for lack of a better description, the most um, uptight and anal retentive people on set because they literally have people's lives in their hands. Um, they don't joke around. They don't really have friendly conversations. They stick to themselves and. Um, focus on the task at hand. Um, most of them, in my experience, seem to be either former military or law enforcement and have some sort of background with firearms. Um, Did you notice a, a difference then generally in terms of just the um, behavior, the general behavior on the movie set of the other armors you worked with as compared to Ms. Gutierrez? Uh, yes. What was that? Um, she wasn't necessarily as... Uh, serious or professional as I'm accustomed to with the other armors that I've worked with. What do you mean? Give us an example. Um, I recall walking by her uh, cart a number of times and firearms and or uh, bandoliers or ammo belts being left out on the cart uh, unsecured. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen an armor pull loose ammo out of a fanny pack. Typically, my experience with armors is um, any ammo they use Blanks or dummies comes out of some sort of container, whether it's a labeled box or um, some other plastic type ammo container. So, um, Now, in terms of you, you indicated that you would see uh, firearms and gun belts unattended on the cart. Um, why was that? Why did that stand out to you? It, it was out of the ordinary. Um, again, my experience is, is most of the firearms I've seen on set come out of some sort of locked bag, locked container. Um, the armor, some armors, depending on the show, have a whole uh, wheel around cart with drawers that they can lock, uh, a drawer that potentially has the individual's actor's uh, or character's name on that drawer. Um, so that character's props would live in that drawer under lock and key. Were the guns and gun belts laying out unattended on the prop cart, was that a safety concern for you? Yes. Why? Uh, it seemed inappropriate and out of the ordinary um, that those firearms weren't secured. So again, some of that with the special cart and all that stuff could be a budget issue. I'm sure the defense is going to argue that, but you get the gist. He's explaining what he thinks a safe armor would do, what he's seen safe armors do in the past on 200 movie sets compared to Hannah Gutierrez, who was not at all safe or professional based on this guy. Okay. Um, he also talked about um, how the armor should never be out of eye shot for the fire armor ammo. He describes the accidental discharges. He also talks about how he told Dave Halls that he was pissed about safety not being a priority and he was ignored. So he kind of went up the chain. Now, what's interesting is a lot of what this guy said, I did feel like was pointing the finger at David Halls, which the defense has to like, and we'll talk about that more on cross-examination. But what's really interesting about this is David Halls is going to testify for the state. I believe he pled guilty. He's already accepted his criminal responsibility. And so in conjunction with this guy pointing the finger at Dave Halls and Dave Halls is going to come and admit wrongdoing, like him coming and admitting wrongdoing and testifying against Hannah Gutierrez, I think is going to be very damning for her. Um, so I'm really interested in exactly how much he's going to accept responsibility wise for the safety meetings, the safety bulletins not being attached because a lot of that's on him. Now he says that, you know, Hannah Gutierrez should have pushed back and she didn't, but a lot of that is on Dave Halls. He also talks about how, he can't touch the ammo or the firearms, but usually he would see that it wasn't a live round and he didn't see Hannah Gutierrez ever doing that on set. So why didn't he ask the question? Why didn't he step up and say, hey, Hannah, why don't you show us these weapons are clear or cold or whatever it may be before we actually use them? So, you know, that was kind of interesting. And then they get into what happened that day. They replaced six camera crew people with only two to three. Um, and then we're going to get into exactly what he remembers about Hannah and David Hall's, you know, calling a cold gun, basically. Thing to draw his weapon. And then from what I know, and setting edit, the scene here, cut, um, would have been, you see, you as the audience, see that weapon start to leave his holster. And then we were going to then put the camera behind him to see the lawman enter the church. And that's when this shootout would have begun in the church. So were cameras rolling? Uh, no, we were still blocking the shot. And... 
were you present in the church when Ms. Gutierrez brought the firearm into the church? Yes. And tell the jury what you saw and or heard. I, I don't, I never saw uh, the interaction between Hannah and Dave in the church, but I could hear uh, Hannah telling Dave that the, um, that the firearm had been uh, checked before lunch and had been locked up during lunch. And then uh, Dave called out cold gun or cold weapon. I heard the word cold. And that's when I went back to focusing on my uh, task at hand. So admission that Hannah was the one that checked the firearm prior to lunch said it was fine. Dave Hall's called cold gun without checking it, presumably, or at least not checking it appropriately in the way that he should. So this is the important part about we've set up what her duty is. We've talked about how she failed in her duty, at least according to this guy. Okay. We're just summarizing his presentation, not necessarily saying what I think. And then now how the gun actually got into Alec Baldwin's hand is because of Hannah Gutierrez and David Hall's. That's basically this guy's, how he explains the series of events. And what's also important, Bodhi asked this question, is the prosecution using this case to help convict Alec Baldwin? Much of this is not relevant to Hannah's trial, but it is for Alec's conviction. So I agree with part of that. And some of this is going to be more important in Alec's uh, trial. And you know maybe they're trying to show them how strong of a case they have. I don't think Baldwin's attorneys are going to be like, oh, we're so scared of this trial now. But they do need to prove the chain of events that happened. They do need to prove the firearm or the ammunition that Hannah Gutierrez was responsible for ended up in this firearm and it was foreseeable that this firearm fired the fatal shot. Now, if the gun went off without Alec Baldwin doing anything, if he just picked it up and the gun went off, maybe that wasn't foreseeable. She didn't think he was going to be using it in this way, in this scene. He could have used a stick or something else. So they are proving that her actions and negligence and recklessness had a foreseeable result. And that foreseeable result is exactly what happened. So they do have to prove that. There are reasons why this stuff is important as well. John, whose responsibility was it uh, for the safety meeting? It seems like it was David Hall's. So I'm interested to hear what his testimony is going to be around all of this. Um, if she's found guilty, will she face jail time? Sorry if that's already been asked. I don't know the answer. She faces jail time. I don't know that that's what the sentence would be because Hall's pled guilty and didn't get any jail time. Amanda said, will we know why her attorney stepped down and she doesn't want him to speak to her anymore? Probably not. Probably not. Reed and Helena find that insert shot. Thank you, Mr. Adiego. Mm -hmm. um, so... Do you recall who said cold gun? Did you describe that? Um, I did. Uh, it was, I heard Dave Hall's call. I don't recall if it was cold gun or cold weapon, but I heard the word cold, which typically for me is what I need to hear. And and, and cold gun means it's not going to go bang. Correct. Okay. Um, with regard to Ms. Gutierrez's statement that you overheard uh, about... And again, she asks a lot of leading questions. A lot of leading questions. I would object to her way more because it does throw her off a little bit. And it actually makes the witness testify, right? Like the witness needs to say that. The lawyer shouldn't give that answer and have him say correct. And she does that a lot. And he was objecting to it for a while. The defense attorney is probably doing some research, it looks like, on his phone right now about something that he's going to cross him on. But like that type of stuff, I would object more if I was him. Her not having checked the gun since lunch, did that cause you any concern? It didn't. Why? Uh, just accustomed to armors checking those guns again on a regular basis. And we had a break. Um, and typically that any firearm that's brought on set is checked, even if it had been checked previously. Any firearm that's brought on set would be checked, even if it was checked previously. That's what he's accustomed to when he's on a movie set. I think that's understandable. And I think if the jury is with the prosecution here, they're going to really eat this guy's testimony up. Now, there are issues, which we'll talk about later, but we're taking this in time, right? I think he did a pretty good job testifying on direct. We'll talk about if Cross changed that. Do you know how the gun got from Ms. Gutierrez to Mr. Baldwin? I do know. So after you heard Ms. Gutierrez's voice and you heard Mr. Hall's uh, call out cold gun, where was the gun the next time you saw it? In um, Mr. Bald uh, yeah, in Mr. Baldwin's um, holster uh, on his left side. Um, did you see Ms. Gutierrez in the church? I don't recall seeing her in the church after lunch, no. 
So go ahead and walk us through. Um, Mr. Baldwin now has the gun. Okay, so I'm going to jump. They show a little bit of this, and I just thought it'd be interesting for those of you that didn't um, watch the trial just to see the actual real movie footage that they used um, in the trial. It's on 1.5 speed, um, so it'll look a little bit funny, but you just get the idea. It's kind of kind of crazy and unprecedented to see this, to me, in a trial that's being streamed to see actual real movie footage. All the rest. Would you straight up nice and slow? Tell us who weapons you have. Again, ready? And how they do it a couple times and how it's made and kind of see how the sausage is made. And we're going to see him do this cross pull move out of the um All the rest. out of the holster. Did you get up nice and slow? Tell us who weapons you have. One more. You good? Ready? All in rough. Did you get up nice and slow? Tell us what weapons you have. What else was going to get right there? So the only way to get that line, so he lands. Okay. Kill camera lands. Yeah. Yep. Is that in this one? Yep. Throw your gun to the top. Okay. Which way? Camera right or left? So camera left for now. I'll stand right here. So, so whip it out. Yeah. Okay, let me get the show. Are you ready? Okay, ready? Okay, ready? Ready. And set. I don't know. And so you get the idea. They do that a couple of times. That's the move they said was unsafe. The defense is trying to argue he should have got more training. He didn't get training. Gutierrez wanted to train him. He said no. It's all Alec Baldwin's fault. The state, the expert there that's on the stand right now before lunch said that's not an abnormal move. It's not an unsafe move. Um, as long as the gun's not loaded with live ammo, cause then everything's unsafe basically. Um, and then we're just going to listen to a little bit, uh, of him recounting exactly what happened that day. He does get choked up when explaining it. I thought it was effective personally. Um, uh, but we'll listen to just a couple minutes of that. Some of the light. Um, um and, um, I think Joel and uh, Joel, the director, and Alec uh, had some uh, brief conversation back and forth about what the goal was for that shot. And um, and I think Alec had drawn it once to kind of audition what he thought his action should be um, for uh, Joel. And um, and then he drew it again, and um, it went off. And uh, you know, instantly, I mean, a, a firearm went off in a small wooden church. So. The concussion, ears ringing, that moment of panic in everybody. Um, I think the first person I made eye contact with was was Selena, who was clearly injured by whatever that gunshot was, that noise we had just heard. And in fact, she was starting to go flush and uh, I think holding her her right side. Um, and, uh, and then I think that Joel... Uh, let out some sort of uh, scream or, or made some noise that, you know, to indicate he was also injured. And, and he tended to Joel and, you know, he goes into detail. It's, it's sad. Um, and it's brutal and the jury needs to hear it. Cause that's the result of this and involuntary manslaughter. One of the elements is proving that it did result in death. And, you know, a couple witnesses have already testified to that. We heard from the uh, person who did the autopsy today as well, which we'll talk about. Um, and then, uh, uh, Lane said, it sounds like the defense is trying to claim disgruntled crew planted live ammo. I don't believe AB should be charged slash convicted. So yes, I agree with you that this is one of the claims the defense is trying to make. They haven't really done it outright yet. They've kind of inferred it um, or wanted the jury to infer it from what they're saying. Um, and I think the state obviously knows it. And that's why they asked this witness, this question to kind of finish up. He's going to talk about that as kind of his, one of his final talking points. Sir, do you recall the question? Crew members who left that morning. Do you have any reason to believe that live ammunition was planted by disgruntled crew members who left that morning? I, I do not. So he just flat out says, no, I do not. Now, will the jury buy that? I don't know. I think the defense will keep pushing it, but the state at least has some record evidence that that 
is not the case here. Now, the jury can listen to other evidence and think that it is, but um, the state definitely knows that this is an argument the defense is making as well. Um, Dana says, Peter, this trial leads me to believe that only lightsabers should be used in movies. Seriously, no real guns on set period. I, I don't understand why we do this anyways. Like it has to look that realistic. We don't have enough like CGI and special effects to make it look realistic enough. Like we even have to take this 0.01% chance. Wouldn't it save money to not have to hire an armorer if you didn't have anything that was any, it was anything but a rubber, you know, looking weapon. I mean, I agree. I agree. And based on everything that you heard when you were in the church after lunch, do you have any understanding of who the person was that loaded that gun? Um, yes. Who is the person that you believe loaded the gun? The armor. And who's that person? Um, Hannah Gutierrez Reed. And do you see her sitting in court today? I, I have seen her. She's behind you. Yes. Okay. And just for the record, can, can you point out what, what Ms. Gutierrez is wearing? Uh, gray blazer with a black collar, hair and a ponytail. Uh, will the record reflect uh, that the defendant leave the church? No. All right. So we're going to jump to his cross now. In Brooklyn basement, I've been saving this question. His testimony isn't biased with the upcoming civil suit. So this is the big question I have for you guys in the chat, and I'm going to try to be watching the chat as uh, we watch this clip. But... So they talk about her being young and, you know, he doesn't like her because she was young and inexperienced and a, a female and whatever. But the, the impactful part of Cross is when he starts to get into the civil suit, to me, I don't think he's biased because he filed the civil lawsuit personally, but I want to hear what you guys think. But the fact that he did not mention Hannah Gutierrez as an at-fault party in his negligence lawsuit to me is really interesting. I thought he had some pretty good answers. Like that's up to my lawyer. I didn't pick who to sue, um, things like that. I'll tell you why I think he didn't sue her as we get into this, but very interesting. The lawyer was very combative. This is the first time I've really feel like he's really gotten in there and mixed it up, which sometimes you need to, the prosecutor starts objecting. Things start to get snippy and snappy here between the lawyers. We'll talk about this, why it's appropriate, why it's not. But I do want to hear from you guys. How important do you think it is that he is filing a civil lawsuit? Does that make him biased? Or is the fact that Hannah Gutierrez Reed is not a named defendant and somebody that he claims was negligent in causing his injuries, which are emotional and probably when he says physical dealing with the ears and things like that, let's listen to um let's listen to this exchange here in cross-examination. Um where is it? It's into it for me. So whether male or female doesn't really matter in that case. Okay. And I want to get into another, and we'll work through these topics, but you've talked a lot about things that you think Ms. Gutierrez Reed did. One of the things you didn't tell the jury is that you've sued Res Production and Alec Baldwin, haven't you? I have. You what? Yes. You, you have a pending lawsuit right now, don't you? Uh, as far as I know, it's pending. Yes, sir. And, you're and I, I like how he, he formed that question. You didn't, you told this jury a lot of things. You didn't tell him you filed a lawsuit. It almost makes it sound like the witness is hiding something which he's not hiding it, but he also didn't tell him. So it's technically true. Attorney's in the courtroom. He is indeed. Been watching your testimony. Clearly. See how you do. You'd have to ask him, sir. Okay. And you sued Alec Baldwin in rest production, but you have not sued Hannah Gutierrez Reed, have you? Again, you'd have to talk to my counsel about who I've actually sued. Have you read the lawsuit? I perused it. You perused it. What does that mean? Did you read it all the paragraphs or did you just read page one and just so knock yourself out, lawyer. Go ahead. Um, I think I got past page one, but since I'm not in your industry, I don't understand what a lot of that is. And I trust my counsel to represent me. It seems like I think some of those are pretty good answers. Some of you guys probably aren't going to like them because people don't like people that file lawsuits sometimes for like any reason. Um, but I think those are pretty good answers. I hate when a client says he didn't read a, a lawsuit, but sometimes it does happen. We always tell them to read it. They have to sign off on it most of the time. But do we like sit there and watch them read every single word? No, not necessarily. Um, Sandra said he's not suing Hannah, so I don't see the bias. And Tracy said, also, Peter, he was subpoenaed to appear, so I don't feel he had an ulterior motive to testify. What's interesting about this is they do ask him, and he does say he, he, does say he was subpoenaed by both sides. But we always got to remember, does a jury get what that means? And who's going to tell him what that means? Because for a lawyer to testify what it means to be subpoenaed versus showing up here voluntarily could arguably be testifying. And facts, not in evidence. If I, I've objected to things like that, when a lawyer tries to explain what something is, um, that affects kind of a, a, a anterior ancillary issue. 
And the judges kept it out because nobody testified to what a subpoena is, why you subpoena a witness, what's the difference between voluntarily showing up. And even if somebody subpoenaed, they could still voluntarily shown up, show up. So do we have the facts that he was forced to show up here against his will? So I, that's always, I saw this question. It just made me think of an interesting discussion point. Um, Vicky said she should have checked the bullets before handling, handing the gun to Hall, period. And I think that's his testimony. Like you're making a lot of opinions earlier on what armors do. You filed a lawsuit. Um, it seems like, and, you, and this is the the lawyer just taking shots now. He's like, "Oh, now you don't have opinion on on legal matters and what a lawsuit is. You had all these opinions on what an armorer does and what an armorer should do. This is argumentative. This is combative. That's definitely objectionable." Uh, in your industry, I don't understand what I'm a lot of that, that is, part. and I trust my counsel to represent me. It seems like you're making a lot of opinions earlier on what armorers do. You filed a lawsuit. Um, it seems like you, you could have read your lawsuit, right? Did, well, I want to ask if he's he's read these paragraphs because he has a totally different story in his lawsuit that he did today. So I want to totally inappropriate speaking argument on objections. And he says, well, I want to go through this lawsuit because he's a totally different story. And by the way, I'm not so sure it was a totally different story. Now, it may be effective in front of the jury hearing that and criminal defense attorneys get a lot more leeway. But I did think that was a little too far to say he has a totally different story in his lawsuit. But. It came out in front of the jury. Can't unring the bell, as they say. I'm going to ask him if he's read and adopted this, this lawsuit. And I think he's already answered that. Did you approve your lawsuit being filed? I must have. Because it was filed. Right? Okay. And, and in that lawsuit, you're suing for a variety of things, punitive damages, right? Again, I'm not a lawyer, sir, so you'd have to discuss that with my counsel. Well, you know you're suing for loss of enjoyment of life. Certainly. Okay. And you know you're suing for medical expenses and non-medical expenses, right? I understood that to be the case, yes. So out of this tragedy, you claim that you have a blast injury, right? I believe that's in the document you're referring to, yes, sir. Did you go to the doctor for a blast injury? Um, I have talked to my physician about what happened that day, yes. You talked to your physician. What, did they do any tests? Did they take any x-rays? Did you just tell him I was in this? And I, what? I described the incident and he did what he felt was appropriate. What was that? I'm not going to discuss my medical treatment with you, sir. Okay. And guess what? That's a perfectly fine answer because he is not on trial at his civil trial. He will have to answer that question, but this is not his civil trial and his injuries are not on trial today. So that was an appropriate answer. Now, uh, if he would have answered it, it's fair game, right? You can ask the question as a lawyer, but it's totally appropriate for him to say, no, I'm not going to answer that. So I thought he handled it pretty well, but I do think I will definitely say as somebody who files civil lawsuits with people, for people, for my clients, it, it did create a little bit of a different view. I thought this guy did a really great job on direct. The defense did enough to make me think he obviously doesn't like Hannah Gutierrez, Alec Baldwin, everybody on set. He's obviously very angry about what happened to his friend. So maybe they did. And when I say bias, I don't mean he's a horrible person or that he's a you know biased guy and he's just coming here and lying. I don't mean that. But they did at least show that he may have a hint of bias. We have to consider when we balance his testimony. Like if his testimony is totally different than anybody else's, maybe the defense has given us a reason to hold on to. But if it's in lockstep, which I believe the state would put him on to think it's going to be consistent with the rest of the state's um, testimony and evidence, then I'm going to buy it, right? So this, the defense can't just say he's biased, therefore throw it out, even if it agrees with everybody. But if there are major differences, they have at least created some different way to look at this witness, which again is, is effective cross-examination. Well, so you're in any event, you're suing uh, breast production and Alec Baldwin, right? Yes. And, and you're here telling this jury all about Ms. Gutierrez-Reed, but in your lawsuit, you talk about defendants, breast production, and Alec Baldwin cut corners and cut costs and then endangered the cast and crew. So you believe that, right? Breast production? I do. And you believe that, that their hiring of Gabrielle Pickle and Roe Walters to manage the budget was not a good idea because they uh, have cost-cutting problems on prior sets? You believe that? Correct. Okay. And you also believe that David Halls had prior safety issues, correct? Uh, yeah. Uh, on a prior set, he didn't. And, and I got to be honest, he said that on direct. He said that it was the crew, it was production, it was David Halls and Hannah Gutierrez. Now, the difference is, and I just would have focused on out of 15 pages, I would have held up the complaint, been like, out of 15 pages here, with all these different defendants and all these different people you blame, Hannah Gutierrez's name comes up zero, if that's true. I don't know if that's true, but if that was true, I'd say her name never pops up. You don't claim she did anything negligent, do you, in this lawsuit? I would have left it at that. I got a sneeze coming. Um, why was Sarah Zachary offered immunity? I'm not positive. Um, it seems like a lot of this stuff, like she was absolved basically by a lot of this, 
you know, she didn't do this. She wasn't there. She didn't load this gun. Her fingerprints weren't on the ammunition. So I hear her name coming up a lot where it seems like she's the fourth person of the four horsemen with Baldwin Halls and Gutierrez, but them three were charged and she wasn't. So I don't know if they just didn't have enough or, or what. Tart said, I'm confused to whom is he biased? He's biased against Hannah Gutierrez is what the defense is trying to put out there. That he's trying to do this to help his lawsuit to get more money, basically. Um, and why didn't he sue her, Francis? Well, a peek behind the curtain. You usually sue the people that are collectible, that are culpable and collectible. If they're culpable but not collectible, you can waste money suing them. If they're collectible but not culpable, you better not sue them because that's frivolous. So the combination of who you sue is culpable and collectible. And I believe that he believes Hannah Gutierrez is culpable, but his lawyers probably believe that she's not collectible. That's my guess. Um, based on experience. Uh, but I don't know what happened. It, it is seems strange why he wouldn't sue her as well. Love dropping a 50 bagger of gifted memberships. Thank you so much. Love for spreading the love as you so often do. Manage that safely. Did he? That was my understanding. You also believe you, you knew that Ms. Gutierrez Reed had asked for more training days as an armor. You knew that. I don't. Sounds like a statement. Over, overruled. Okay. You're aware that Ms. Gutierrez Reed asked Gabrielle Pickle for more time as an armor, more training days, and more armor days. You're aware of that. I became aware of that after two people were shot. Yes, sir. Okay. Well, we, you were, it's in your lawsuit. It's part of your lawsuit. Okay. okay. So let me ask you this. Are you hoping that you can come in and testify here today and something happens to Ms. Gutierrez Reed that you can, it'll help your lawsuit? I'm hoping for justice, sir. First two people so. were injured on a film set. That has not only affected me, that has affected the film industry. And you want money for that? I want justice. You in want what? money. You're, you're it's hard to get this back and forth, right? It's tough to get this back and forth because in the civil justice system, you can only get justice. You can't. A perfect answer would have been, sir, there's no eye for eye justice here. There's no go back and take it away. There's no time machine. So in the justice system, the only thing you can ask for to create change is money sometimes. And sometimes money does create the change that we need and institute justice. Now, that would be a lawyer answer. So it's really tough for lay people to go back and forth with lawyers like this. So I, I get it. I get it. Plus, it didn't say justice. It says money. Again, says you'd have to for money. Is that isn't that correct? Mr. Bowles needs to let the witness answer the question. He's being argumentative. This needs to be a cross. I, I'll let him answer. I, I agree. You're suing for money. I asked my lawyer to help bring justice in this case, and if that doesn't mean criminal, then I would assume that means some sort of monetary justice. Yes. Okay. I don't. Again, I don't think no. it was a bad answer. Now, he does get defensive and argue back with the lawyer, and it's pretty um, argumentative back and forth. But overall, overall, I don't think this witness or the lawyer came off overly horrible or argumentative or like a jerk in this exchange. I really don't. I saw, I got comments and messages that this person was horrible or that person was horrible or they came off bad or whatever it may be. I'm watching this and somebody who's seen some heated and been involved in some heated cross-examinations I don't see anything incredibly over the top here. Uh, I thought both of them did a pretty effective job of what they're supposed to do in their prospective situation. Uh, you also understood that Mr. Halls did not post the safety bulletins on, a, on, a, on any of the call sheets, correct? I understood that production did not furnish us with safety bulletins here. Okay, so production. So, well, objective to being argumentative, John said. So, John, I think this is very possible. Like, your objective when you're talking about the facts of this case, but somebody starts accusing you of being biased, most people and witnesses do get a little defensive and argumentative, um, even if they were objective in, in answering the questions. Uh, to have your integrity questioned is a tough thing in open court being live streamed to America. Um, they talk about, uh, you know, more about halls and production and their negligence. Um I think here, I want to jump ahead a little bit too. He he does take some shots at, at Hannah Gutierrez during cross as well. Testimony? I do. Now, what channel, radio channel, were you using on set? Would you regularly use? I'm a grip, so I'm always on channel eight, sir. Channel eight. And do you, do you understand, or did you understand that the armor operates on channel one? And that's when that's called out on channel one. And it goes to David Halls. Did you know that? Um, if it only goes to channel one and Dave Halls, then somebody's failed at their job because their job is to let everybody know what's going on with firearms and ammunition on set. And were you aware then, sir, before you gave your testimony to the jury that that responsibility is Mr. Halls then to call out, we're going to have a gun scene. Were you aware of that? I'm aware of what Mr. Halls' responsibilities are, certainly. Okay. Well then why didn't you say that earlier that when this was called out, you may have been on the wrong channel. Maybe Mr. Halls didn't call it out. Did you not know that? I don't understand your question. I wasn't right. on the wrong channel. I'm on channel eight where I'm supposed to be, sir. Okay. Well then the failure was not Ms. Gutierrez-Reeds. What you wanted to imply to the jury was Mr. Halls, wasn't it? 
um, Miss Gutierrez Reed loaded a firearm that killed my friend and injured a director. I'm not talking about the incident. I'm talking about. I mean, that's tough when that happens on cross and the witness is able to get out that answer and the jury hears it. That's tough. And you can tell lawyer's not happy. He immediately jumps back in, almost tries to cut him off. That's the type of stuff you don't want coming out in cross. And when you have kind of these long disjointed parts of cross, sometimes they can, if you don't have your questions real tight to lock them in. Sometimes something like this can happen. The negligent I feel like they've already gotten him to admit that Halls is negligent. So I think they should have just gone with it. And he was trying to get it for like the third or fourth time. Okay, well, then the failure was not Miss Gutierrez Reed's, which you wanted to imply to the jury. It was Mr. Halls, wasn't it? Um, Miss Gutierrez Reed loaded a firearm that killed my friend and injured a director. I'm not talking about the incident. I'm talking about the negligent discharge with Sarah Zachary. We're talking about that incident. Now, first of all, you have no idea who loaded that weapon that Miss Zachary negligently discharged, do you? I wasn't there when the weapon was loaded, so no. Okay. And so he's trying to bring him back to the negligent discharge, the accidental discharge, and the witness is trying to focus on why we're here today. So, you know, that's, again, why he had to go back to that, I probably wouldn't have, but it is what it is. All right, some more fireworks here before we finish up with Cross. Anybody else, if you were so concerned about it, you reported to Gabrielle Pickle, did you report it to anybody else, did you reported to Joel Souza? Um, I believe that Joel Souza and Helena, before she was killed, had a conversation about some of the safety issues, that was my payroll question. issues, and I did notify Local 80, which was the union that represented me while I was making that movie. When did you notify Local 80? You'd have to contact Local 80. It was early in the movie, and I can't give you a definitive date, sir. Well, no, I'm asking you. I'm not going to contact Local 80. You're not here in court. Because he's already going to give you his number. Judge, can, can I do my cross-examination? Well, if you do it properly, you can. Uh, I'll do it properly. Listen, listen, listen. Yeah. Ask the question. Yeah about the date. He said he didn't remember. And then you started to tell him you weren't going to ask that person and that he was going to tell you in so many words. Okay. Yes. So let's, I like this judge. Cause she's right. She repeats the question. He asked, the guy said he doesn't know. And then he, he like, you know, was kind of bully balling him saying, I'm not going to ask them. I'm asking you. It's like, well, I answered you. I don't know. I was saying, if you want to know the answer, you can ask them. Obviously I don't care if you ask them, but I like how the judge had handled this back and forth. It's not be argumentative. Let's yeah. just ask them. You can ask them one more time. So do you have any idea what date you may have contacted local lady? I believe it was in the first week of production. Okay. So the first. So, um, he also talked about everyone had to be ready when Baldwin was on set made Baldwin kind of seem like a bully controlling things. That was kind of how the, the cross ended. Um, on redirect, the state brings up that lots of people are suing rust, lots of lawsuits, um, did you lose enjoyment of life? And he, you know, cries through the issues and they open the door for him to explain how horrible this has been an effect on him and everybody else, which I thought was effective from the state to have to respond. If they're going to bring up the lawsuit, you know, go ahead and explain it. Why are you suing? Why is this so bad? Why do people deserve justice in this situation? And he did a good job explaining that. I did want to play the end of redirect because I thought it was really clunky and not great from the state. And I'm going to explain more later about how there have been some misuses of witnesses and trying to squeeze a little too much out of them. Cause this guy gave the state a lot. I feel like they reached for a little bit too much here, right at the end of redirect. So we're going to listen to a little bit of this and then we're going to finish recapping the rest of the witnesses here. And I'll get you out of here before they come back from lunch. Working on the set of rust uh, when to, things were chaotic and difficult. And not to my knowledge. No. Is Mr. Baldwin on trial today? Uh, it appears that he is a bit, yes. It, I'm asking you, is this the trial of Mr. Baldwin? Again, he's not picking up what she's putting down, and he picks it up on the second time, but it's the start of the clunk. No, it's not. Is this the trial of Russ Productions? Uh, no, it's not. Is Mr. Hall's on trial today? He is not. On October 21st, 2021, did Ms. Gutierrez show the dummy rounds to the cast and crew, as you have indicated, is proper safety protocol for armors? Uh, not when I was on set, no. Did Ms. Gutierrez... Could have just ended it right there shake the dummy rounds for the cast and crew not when i was on set no if ms gutierrez had shown the dummy rounds here we go this is like the one question too many if she would have shown and now we're going to get into it lisa thank you for gifting five memberships the cast and crew what do you think would have happened um we we if he has an opinion if he, if, if he knows basically. it was kind of a speculation question it was a good objection She's going to ask it again, and the clunk continues. On his personal knowledge. In your opinion, working on this movie set with Ms. Gutierrez and working on other movie sets with other armors, if she had taken the dummies, rattled them, showed them to the cast and crew, do you think that live round would have been discovered? No. You don't? Oh, pardon me. Had we looked at all of the ammo, we would have known whether it was dummies or live. Who made the decision? 
she's trying to lead him and he doesn't know where she's leading him. And it just continues like this. And it just was not a great ending. Um, Carter, thank you for gifting five memberships as well. And so this is like, you got enough out of this witness. Move on to the next witness. Not to show the cast and crew the dummy rounds prior to handing the gun to anyone in the church. I would guess the armor or. Yeah, he just he, he is, he all right. All right. That's his answer. He guessed. So we'll strike. You would literally say, I would guess, which is speculation, which you can't do. Okay. He guessed. Is it your understanding that Ms. Gutierrez loaded that gun? It, it is. Sorry, did you all hear me? Keep your mic on. Yes, you're all saying yes. Okay. In your opinion, would Ms. Hutchins be alive today if Ms. Gutierrez had not put a live round in the gun? I'm going to strike that. He didn't get an answer. I mean, just a All nightmare right. finish from what I thought was a pretty good witness for them. Who is the person on the set of a movie who is in charge of firearms? Ask an answer. Sustain. I'm getting Elaine Bredehoff. Do you know why your civil lawsuit doesn't include Ms. Gutierrez? You'd have to refer to my counsel for that answer. I don't know. Which he already said on crime. Have you testified today in order to further your civil lawsuit? Um, I've testified today to bring justice for the death of my friend. Thank you, sir. She was just trying to get something decent before she sat down. So it really was a tough ending. It was it was a really tough ending there for the state. Um, but let's jump into some of the other witnesses that have come today as well. Uh, the witness dis uh, discussed the autopsy, ruled an accidental death, death. So a lot of people are saying, well, then how is it a crime, Peter? How is it a crime? It was ruled accidental. This case should be over. Well, involuntary manslaughter is involuntary. It is unintentional, AKA accidental. So just because something is accidental does not mean it is not criminal. Um, so again, no real surprises there with the autopsy. Then we have someone from the sheriff's office with firearms background that he cleared the gun that Hannah Gutierrez Reed presumably or allegedly put the wrong ammunition in. We've heard about that rifle a few times. Then we had a digital forensic examiner who extracted phones. Um, he's, the guy was definitely not the best with dates. He said the wrong year and then he said the wrong day. Um, and I believe the texts were Hannah Gutierrez asking to get her stuff back. Maybe that's the drugs. I don't know. I'm sure we're going to hear more on that. Cross made it seem like he didn't look at Baldwin's phone and Kenny's phone, but on redirect, uh, the state gets back up and says, well, Baldwin turned his phone over in New York, right? Right. Um, and then the last witness, which is on the stand right before lunch and Cross is going to come after lunch, is the firearm expert. Before I get to him, let me hit some questions. Hey, Peter, I'm an OG of the lawyer you know, but I've been watching this gavel to gavel with EDB. It's been fun, but I love to hear your commentary. Yeah. That's why I think it's cool to do it uh, during lunch because some people, I don't know if Emily is, but I know like, you know, court TV and whatever recovery addict, they'll take breaks during lunchtime. So I'll come in, kind of give my opinion during lunch for people that are following along with it the whole time. I may switch to nights at some point, but for now, lunch has worked okay. Vicky, having been questioned in this manner on the witness stand, I find this attorney objectionable. If I'm a juror, I would weigh against the defendant. And there may be some that really don't like the way that it's going, but I don't know. We'll see. Um, okay. So he did reconstruction in this case. He said the gun was in proper working order when the FBI got it. They didn't really explain how he knows that, but he did testify to it. Um, the gun that is in evidence is a brother gun, not the actual Baldwin gun that they're calling it. Now they showed pictures of the hammer, you know, cocked in different positions. He demonstrates how it works. I think he's, you know, doing a pretty good job, a likable witness. The jury's probably going to like and trust him at this point. He reconstructed the, the gun, placed it all in the positions to see, you know, if the hammer would have been damaged when Baldwin had it, would it ever been able to be fired? He says no. Again, effective evidence for the state. Not as important for Gutierrez Reed, although they do have to prove it. Going to be more important in Baldwin's case, this witness for sure. Um, in order to fire this weapon in October of 2021, Baldwin would have had to pull the trigger. He stated that very precisely, very authorita authoritatively, and unequivocally, which is why the state should have never asked that other FBI firearms guy this question because he kind of wiggled back and forth and was wishy-washy and like, well, under what I know in these circumstances then, yes, likely it would have had to happen like that. It was kind of confusing. It wasn't a great yes answer, which if you're the state and you know that you have this guy, Haig, I think his name is, testifying later in the case, just don't even ask the other guy that. 
get the really good, solid testimony and evidence and answer that you want as a lawyer. It's hard to not get all the evidence and pile it on top, but you want it the cleanest, best way you can present it to the jury because now that they've already heard the wishy-washy answer, are they not going to pick up this answer as strongly? Maybe, maybe not. Also, just kind of behind the scenes in lawyer world, sometimes judges will limit expert or testimony to individual specialties or individual opinions. Like you can't have 15 people come up and say, yes, Baldwin had to, had to pull the trigger. So sometimes they'll limit it to one and it would have been horrible if it would have been limited to just that first witness and not this guy. Um, and again, nobody's really arguing that he didn't pull the trigger or that this projectile didn't come from this firearm, but the state still has to prove it. Um, he again had no issue with Baldwin kind of pulling the gun out that way. Didn't think it was a dangerous maneuver. Didn't think that added to the negligence in this case at all. John said, could a waiter get charged with involuntary manslaughter if they unknowingly served someone peanuts Different perspective, no, because a waiter does not have a duty to test every dish for peanuts, first off. They don't have a duty to make the dish. They don't even have a duty in most places to know what's in a dish, and not every place asks for allergies. Now, if they were told they have a peanut allergy and it was accidentally, like you said, unintentionally or unknowingly putting it in there, what is their duty? What is foreseeable? What standard can they be held to? I would say, no, that would be a reach. But when you're talking about an armorer whose job it is to make sure live ammunition does not make it on set and into a firearm, and they're supposed to check every firearm they give to a, an actor. I mean, this is her exact duty that she failed in. Does it rise to the level of criminal negligence? I'm not sure. It absolutely blows the doors off of civil negligence, but does it rise to that higher level to get to beyond a reasonable doubt with that standard for um, a criminal involuntary manslaughter, accidental killing case. All right. Under an hour today, got you through all the witnesses up to date on what's happened over the last day. Check us out tomorrow. Um, we're going to probably continue to do the daily updates. I don't know though. I might, I might take two days and summarize two days on the next video. We'll see. Cause we've got the Coburger stuff going on tomorrow, but make sure you guys subscribe and hit that reminder bell. So you don't miss the Lori Vallow day bell video tonight and all of the other content we've got coming your way. I appreciate you guys joining me for this lunchtime live and wherever people are watching it. If you think they'd enjoy the light lunchtime hour, let them know that we're doing these breakdowns at lunch so they can come hang out with us as well. I appreciate you guys as always until next time I'm out of here. Don't forget to hit the like button on the way out. Thanks for watching another episode of the lawyer. You know, if you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok. And don't forget to check out the Lawyer You Know podcast with new seasons dropping every quarter. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, the Lawyer You Know.